two drone experts here today talking about the drone industry. Hey, I'm Harrison Nolan, the CEO and founder of Rock Robotic, and I'm also the host of the YouTube channel, Indiana Drones. Hi, I'm Nick Boone. I'm the president of operations with Fly Guys. I'm here to talk about LiDAR and the drone industry. Let's get down to it. Hey, Nick, so how'd you get in the drone industry? How'd this even happen? Kind of on accident, if I'm being honest. Um, my roommate has flown drones for, or my, my old roommate, I should say, has flown drones for about nine years. So kind of when they first came out, um, I was getting my master's in college. And uh, Fly Guys came in and did a pitch, and they were looking for help. So as part of my um, capstone course in the master's program, I actually did a full breakdown of what they should do marketing-wise from an SEO perspective and gave them a booklet. And then as soon as I graduated, they kind of offered me a position. And so uh -huh. I moved around for the past you know, several years with the company, um, worked my way into operations, eventually VP of operations, and then president of operations. So I've been... I've been heavily involved in drones for the past three and a half years, um, have managed thousands of missions um, across the country. And so we get to play with all kinds of things from your little basic Mavic minis all the way up to your Wingtras and your DJI 300s. That's awesome. Wait, so you got you got into it from the kind of the marketing perspective. So that means you're honestly the, the marketing stuff, you kind of learn everything in the industry what's going on you're, you're hearing everything and trying to especially years ago when you know this industry was so nascent i mean how is how do you feel like this has changed you know just a couple of years ago to today in this drone industry yeah i mean and I, I feel like there there obviously has been a change but even the change that we've seen where three years ago you'd say hey drones and people would be like yeah it could work i guess so now you say drones and they're like, yeah, we've seen it done. We're playing with the idea of maybe doing it. Um, even that, I feel like we're in that early stage of inception, you know, like. Couldn't agree know, more. Yeah. Know, adopted yet. I feel like, yeah, just for me, like, honestly, our first like real paying LIDAR job was just a, a couple of years ago. Like other than, you know, LIDAR work being like, a, it was always like an R&D budget, some you know, someone wanted to experiment with it, try something. It's like an R&D, like a proof of concept kind of yeah. thing. We're, we're still getting, that's a lot of the stuff we get is let's let's do this job for the first time, see if there's a, an added value to what we traditionally do. And that's still probably a large percentage, you know, like 30, 40% of, of the jobs we do is just initial concept for people. Exactly. Which is wild just seeing it going from 100% down to like this 30% because you know, what we're seeing on our side, we're seeing people actually, This it's hitting like the in production, right? It's being used in the field professionally, like drones uh, in general, you know, photogrammetry, but also this, uh, this LIDAR technology is actually just, it's becoming just a tool, just another tool that you just use. It's not this big kind of a mysterious thing uh, that you want to kind of experiment with. But I think it was, uh, gosh, it must be two or three years ago now when I got my first like real repeat like a uh, client who was just like doing lidar all the time you know because before before rock i was a service company for you know five years and we did you know a lot of lidar services and well, so was, I mean, same question to you you know how did you get into the industry uh how did i get into the drone industry well it was 2015 and i started uh getting into agriculture uh drones and trying to figure out this uh, crop analytics and doing you know precision agriculture with with drones and that was the whole multispectral side of things. Multispectral, yeah. We actually we actually did uh, hyperspectral, thermal, visible. We built these uh, co-aligned gimbal systems, and we I mean we had these 15 foot wingspan drones. Uh, we we were crazy. We had no idea. We thought this is what everyone was doing. We flew these 15 foot wingspan drones all over the Midwest, and we were just you know trying to get get work and get jobs, but it was. You know, at the time, 2015, I mean, this is before part 107. So this is, you know, part three through three days getting exemptions. And uh, it was just, I mean, we were, I felt like we were like cowboys, you know, the wild, wild west was upon us and we were just hitting the ground and, and going. Then fast forward, we um, got some really large contracts with some utilities. And all of a sudden we started doing a lot of utility work and we were building up like some computer vision models to do like kind of asset uh, management. So for like transmission corridors and all these different pieces of the, the transmission structure. Uh, and then this led us into LIDAR. 
and we saw this LIDAR thing was incredibly useful. Um, and the way of getting the LIDAR data was just very, very difficult. Most, most times, especially for the utilities, they would order LIDAR and then they would not get it, you know, back for like six months. And, you know, we were just like, wait, we're, we can go out this afternoon, get this data, get it back to you tomorrow. Is that fine? And so this kind of spawned this whole journey that evolved into Rock Robotic. And now Rock, we're trying to make a LIDAR as affordable and easy as possible, both in the hardware and, and in our software. Uh, I think there's a, just a huge, huge, huge future in this stuff. It's we're like you were saying, we're just on the tip of this iceberg. Yeah, we had um, we had kind of an independent analysis done by I forget who. I don't want to misquote, but essentially they talked about how big the drone industry is going to become over the next ten years, mm. and it's going to be you know a multi-billion-dollar industry. And if you look at the bell curve, mm -hmm. we're still in the early adopter phase mm -hmm. the majority of people that will be using drones once it becomes a, a mainstream thing still haven't even started looking at them i think i think this brings up a really good question is like where where do you think it's going to go from here like what's this you say we're at this early part of the bell curve i agree i think we're also at this early part of this bell curve but where do you think it's going to go in the next maybe five years and then maybe push it down the horizon 10 20 years Man, it's a it's a hard answer. Yes. Uh, obviously, obviously, my answer is going to be it's going to be more widespread and more adopted. Like yeah. right now, if you talk to a random person on the street about drones, drones are a hobbyist thing that people use to spy on their neighbors. Right. You know, and that's all they're good for. Like, I, I, I will say, thank. I mean, I'm glad that we're beyond this. So in 2015, it was all about. Uh, you know, using them and, and, you know, for bombing people. So that yeah. was what the nomenclature, that's what the, you know, the zeitgeist was for, yeah. for drones. It was that, now it's the spying. So we're, uh, we're moving a little bit, you know, slowly. And, and, and slowly it's going to become more and more accepted. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be this realization that, you know, like, like one satellite imagery exists. I could see your backyard if I wanted to kind of thing. Um, Google Street View. That's not what we're doing. You know, it, it's going to be adopted. It's going to come. It's going to become a commonplace thing in a lot of industries. Yeah, Whether that's construction for progress monitoring. I know they're already doing trials for delivery. Um, I don't think that's five years out. I think that's probably on the ten years outside of things because there's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff you're going to have to get through. I mean, we can talk talk about that for a second because you know I've you know I was flying these uh, large drones right and. Uh, you know, the largest map, I made a 800 square kilometer North Mosaic map with the drone. Uh, yeah, it's huge, right? This is massive. And operating, I don't, it's one thing that people just don't get about, you know, operating drones is like, these things require maintenance. Like, yeah, it's not, these delivery drones, are they, I mean, it's not the most reliable. I mean, it's reliable technology, yes, if you're there to maintain the equipment. I would say that. Well, there's, there's that side of things. So that's everything the, the company could control, right? Yeah. Then you have the other side of things, like you've done all of your logistics as the company, like Walmart, and I forget who were teaming up and, and whatnot, but like, okay, so you've got your delivery routes, you've got your FAA waivers, you can go beyond visual line of sight, you can do all of that. Well, grandma that just ordered for Amazon, like put a new vegetable garden in her backyard mm -hmm. and we're thought you could land all of a sudden you can't land and the first time you you miss that and accidentally you know land on somebody's chihuahua like so I, you're, yeah you're bringing up something that's really uh, i thought about so much and honestly with fly guys and uh the drone network that you're you know, building for pilots to be capturing data a distributed model of being able to capture data over you know any area that you need it at at a kind of a moment's notice uh, this is really awesome because I, I believe the future is going to be a lot, yeah, a lot more autonomous flight, a lot more the delivery stuff will be going to start happening. No matter what, we're just going to see, we're going to move towards that future. But in that future, you brought up a great point about, you know, things change. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of, uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar, but in the autonomous vehicle market, this thing called HD maps. And this is essentially like, you know, very detailed map of the road, which has everything, you know, the center lines, the lane markings and signs, signage, you know, turns, you know, everything, speed limits. 
it's just a detailed digitized map of the road. And I, I believe we're going to need the exact same thing for, you know, you know, autonomous flight or VLOS. You know, it really just doesn't, I don't know why people aren't talking about this more because in the autonomous vehicle market, you need to have this map, this offline map, because if you think about it, even, even like when you drive somewhere using Google Maps, you're still going to use a map to get your directions for how to go from A to B. Right. But you're going to use your real-time senses to, you know, dodge grandma walking across the road, you know, stop. You, you do all the real-time stuff, but you still use that map. So I believe it's going to be the same thing with, like, the future of the drone industry when we're getting more beeve loss. And in order, order to get there, it does require an army of pilots to go out there and capture data, you yeah, know. To get mapped somewhere first. Everything. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and, and repeatedly, you know, it has to always get done. Yeah. Anyway, that's a, I think that's a part of the future. You know, when you struck a, a chord there, because I, I really believe this. It's a, to, get, to get a little more specific, um, we talk about drones. We have photogrammetry, RGB, multispectral, hyperspectral, thermal. What is LiDAR and who needs it? What is LiDAR? Great question. So LiDAR is different than uh, photogrammetry. It's a, it's a remote sensing technology. It's an active laser. I actually have a LiDAR right here in my hand. So this is, it's not actually just a LiDAR. This is a, a LiDAR mapping system, which is a little different because this sensor right here, this is a LiDAR. This shoots uh, about 240,000 laser pulses out of it every second. And so kind of the whole idea here is that we want to be able to make a 3D model very accurately. So we're going to send these laser pulses and make a distance measurement. And then inside of here, we have a bunch of navigation information. that's going to tell us exactly where we're located on the Earth, as well as our orientation of this device. So if we know both where we are and our orientation, we can cast these laser pulses and then project those points onto the Earth in three dimensions. And so the beauty here is that it's very accurate and it can be done, you know, you know, very reliably, repeatably. And, you know, we're photogrammetry, you're gonna be stitching stuff together. Photogrammetry works great, but sometimes it doesn't always stitch together. Whereas this one's a active sensor, it's going to be directly projecting those points on the ground. Photogrammetry, you're gonna take a bunch of photos and stitch them together and you'll get, you know, kind of computer vision errors on this. Both are great technologies. I love them both. Not to interrupt, but specifically, just a little nuanced answer to that, right? Comparing yeah. photogrammetry to LIDAR, you can read so many blogs, so many articles about when to use which one, why to use which one. I think it's safe to say like RGB photogrammetry, we do a ton of that at Fly Guys, mm -hmm. has its place. It's perfectly acceptable. It's highly accurate when used in the correct setting. Mm -hmm. But you talk about when it works. Mm -hmm. So for instance, shadows if your site's too big you have to fly all day you might actually have to turn that into multiple days to fly around solar noons so you can put everything together mm -hmm. you know uh, if if the light is, isn't good now there's there's some frame of reference there like technically overcast days are good because your shadows are more consistent but obviously you can't fly at night um, right there are a lot of things that could mess up photogrammetry but i think just to jump on that really quick. So I started out doing photogrammetry. This is like my bread and butter. And once I went over into LiDAR, the one thing that I just really, really liked about doing LiDAR was that I didn't worry. <laughs> like I would go out and fly and capture a site. And I knew if it was logging data, I would have the full site done. And right. like, it's a very small nuance thing. But uh, if anyone's out there doing photogrammetry and they come back, if you're using Pix4D and you get the little red dots everywhere, because the photos didn't uh, didn't find any matches, yep. you know that feeling where you're like, "Dang it! Like I gotta go. I'm gonna go back out. I'm gonna add some more. I'll figure it out." But like that reliability of having data, although that's not like the primary difference. I feel like as just an operator, that's one big difference for me. Yeah, exactly. But I'd say the primary difference. So trees. Yep. Vegetation. Vegetation. Yeah. I mean, beauty of this this bad boy here is that. This, these laser pulses, they're, they're really small. Like basically it's a laser pointer, really small. And that laser point will go in between the leaves and hit the ground and then come back up and get measured. So they say seeing through the trees, not really seeing through, you're just kind of looking through the cracks, but you're able to get reliable data below the canopy. So when I, difficult. And I go one step further, like that's, that's going to be the answer 99% of people, right? Yeah. The big 
the big plus sign for LIDAR is anywhere you're dealing with vegetation. You can do photogrammetry on, you know, a dirt work site pretty easy. Pretty easy, yep. You know, um, you could do LIDAR just as accurate, but <laughs> where you can't do the photogrammetry is, you know, pre-clearing where you want to see the ground before the trees are going. Mm -hmm. That's going to be 99% of people. I go a step further than that and say any highly complex site, as a for instance, yeah, that roller coaster you did. That was so much fun, by the way. It was, how, how would photogrammetry get in between all that lattice work? You would, it would not happen. I mean, you could go and take photos around every single beam and then try piecing as, but yeah, no, good luck. Yeah, it'd be nightmare. No, I actually, so my, my rule of thumb is like, anytime I'm experiencing objects with 90 degrees in them. So usually if you see like building something like that and you got even like the top of a building, you know, anytime there's a discontinuity in something. So you get maybe a road, a curb on a road, like photogrammetry will always kind of blobulize this stuff. It's hard to, unless you get a ton of photos of that one specific feature, it just, doesn't come out and it takes forever to do and then it's yeah. got to be done perfect but yeah, you know like, uh, your, your model is essentially creating that surface and then your, your triangulation is kind of building like you said that little ramp up where your yeah. angles are so it's actually a big we've been seeing a lot of people who are doing like planimetrics with uh this stuff and you know they're doing these curbs right that's like a big piece is like getting that the gutter and the curb and getting you know the top of curb back of curb and pulling those measurements from the LIDAR data. It's been pretty cool seeing people use it for that. Yeah. So Nick, I want to talk to you about, uh, so Fly Guys in making a uh, distributed drone pilot network. How, why, and what? Yeah, so kind of everything. That's, that's the short answer. Um, we specialize in, in aerial data capture. Um, we do some stuff on the ground too. We have a network that we can kind of roll out different use cases. So we've started doing some 3D modeling with like Matterports and stuff. But the bread and butter is a nationwide drone pilot network that is trained to do missions. You know, so our network is, I always lose count of the number. They always have to remind me. I think it's somewhere around 5,600 pilots right now in the U.S., we're toying with the idea of maybe expanding to, you know, all of Canada while we have a handful currently, you know, it's only a handful, but we're, we're talking about maybe expanding, but we have about 5,600 pilots in the United States and we do everything from basic marketing work. So just your, your images and videos to progress monitoring to, which is going to be your, your ortho mosaics, just your repeatable weekly, bi-weekly missions to 3D modeling, to multispectral, thermal, solar panel inspections, to we're working with, you know, Rock Robotics. I'm building out kind of a scalable solution with LiDAR. So I'm kind of curious. So you have two, two target audiences here. So one is the uh, operator network, and the other is the uh, basically the, the client who needs to get work done. Yep. So how do you kind of defi divide your time between the two? major tar target markets here um it's kind of an interesting question we we focus mainly on our clients or that has been our focus mm -hmm. um, we are actually in the process and i don't think we've talked to anybody about it um we're actually in the process of kind of building out a pilot success division mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. before we've kind of worked with pilots, we'll work with our new pilots on kind of smaller missions. So we have to make sure we get kind of smaller work in their area so we can vet new pilots and say, okay, let's go do, you know, this little marketing job, which arguably is harder than doing a mapping job because it's more like, no, I wanted this specific angle at this specific time of day, you know, but we work with people and we generally, okay, we worked on this. We gave you some of the, the, the jargon, like doing dollies and flyovers and, now we're going to work you up to a mapping mission. And so we've kind of cultivated pilots organically. Mm -hmm. uh, we're playing with the idea of doing a pilot success program where we have a step-by-step -step teachable guideline of like mission management to where we can, we can just build pilots without needing the missions in place. I think that's a really smart idea. Kind of the, the training, the follow on 
to our pilots to get become better pilots. You know, I know gaining access to reliable information in this industry has kind of historically been a little bit difficult. Um, that's actually why, you know, I, I experienced so much success, at the, you know, with Indiana Drones, this YouTube channel, is that, you know, my first video, I did a comparison of, of like two LIDARs. And yep. uh, I think I was the first person to ever do that. Yep. Like it was um, honestly, so coming back into, you know, where before pre-rock, you know, I did a lot of work with several other LiDAR manufacturers and it was always, you know, a big no-no. Don't talk about, you know, our hardware in comparison to other people or don't do this, don't do that. And it, it just made me feel very, very dirty, I guess, or wrong. I had the same word rolling around in my head. Yeah, it's just, it's because it made me feel like my allegiance wasn't to the pilot. My allegiance wasn't to the customer. Like my allegiance was like to this business tricking people into buying something. So creating this information asymmetry so they didn't know so they would buy and then no and then i don't know i just coming from like more the tech world and you know open source community you know I, I think it's more knowledge more education reliable information is the most important thing and it's the only thing that's going to help our industry grow so I, I really commend you on this just i think you guys should pursue this uh for the the pilots kind of becoming and you can monetize it. I'm, I'm sure, you know, people will pay money to go through training and learn stuff and have recurring training. I think that would be good as well. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of in the works for us. Um, to piggyback off of what you were saying, though, like you're talking about, like, we're, we're in this industry where people, I don't want to say want to want to hoard information, but they want to make things seem extremely complicated. But that puts out this misinformation, essentially. For mm -hmm. instance, um, and I mean, we may decide to cut this, but I'm just going to say, for instance, like the the sensor y'all used recently, we had a conversation with a client. I, I think it's like the Livebox Avia is the sensor on the R2A. Yep. They essentially like just said, well, we're never going to use the Livebox Avia because it's not accurate. And we had to like do a full timeout, like, hold on. Why? And they said, well, we use the Livebox Avia on this system and blah, blah, blah. And we got numbers like, x y and z and it's like well it's not just the sensor like you have your sensor and then you have your your imu and then you have all your controls and it's yep. like i can i can show you a data set that compares sensor a to a live box avia sensor with a better imu and it comes in tighter than you're asking yeah it's, it's like all this misinformation of well for instance, um, what's on the the DJI L1? It's also it's also Navia. Yep. And people go, oh, the DJI L1, it's a live box Avia, and the information doesn't come out great. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things involved in that. Exactly, a, a lot. So yeah, I think just the misinformation, or yeah, it's not misinformation. It's a it's on the onus is on us to get good information out there. Like we, yeah. and, and it's cool hearing you say this because I. I definitely, you know, being in this industry for a long time, a lot of people don't want you to do that. And I think it's, uh, it's disruptive. It's yeah. just disruptive. And to be a disruptor, I know some people don't like this. And, but every day I, I go back and I say to my, you know, team and myself, I say, who are we responsible to? And to me, I feel my only responsibility is to these customers, to people who are trying to make money with drones. People who want to, you know, get in this industry like I have been in for so many years and experienced so much success. And so and I, I feel like, you know, Fly Guys and your guys' mission is also, you know, trying to give these pilots opportunity, you know. So this is a, a big piece of it is, you know, creating opportunity for pilots or people that want to become a professional in this industry. Well, with the Fly Guys network, you can become successful. Exactly. So, I think this is a, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of uh, synergy between what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do. And uh, it's kind of, it's pretty nice. <laughs> and Nick, what's the coolest thing you've seen or done with a drone? Okay. So honestly, the coolest project I've seen with LIDAR is probably the video of the roller coaster. Sweet. If I'm being honest, um, the coolest project that we've done uh, in house at Fly Guys let's say with LIDAR specifically, we do, we do some interesting stuff with cell towers, like the 3D modeling is mm -hmm. mind blowing when you do it the right way with RGB. 
but it's very, very, very time consuming and the process is strict. Um, mm-hmm. Coolest thing we've done, we did a project in New York um, that was several hundred acres and the guy essentially, it's all forested. Mm-hmm. The guy wanted to see these three foot tall walls that were 200 years old and were covered in vegetation and wanted to see kind of where all of those were on the property to figure out where he should be building. Mm -hmm. Um, Doesn't sound that cool, but when you think of how long that would have taken like traditional surveyors, like that would have been a month with four teams and they probably would have missed stuff. You know, we did it in three days. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. after, After we filtered out all the vegetation and came up with the right ground classification algorithms, we generated, you know, the, these elevation models where you could clearly see like 47 or something different walls. That's awesome. That's awesome. We, we are in the process of doing some 3D modeling stuff. So we're, we're in the process of trying to do some stuff for stadiums that I think is going to be really cool. Oh, definitely. But we haven't done it yet. How about you? The coolest thing that I've flown or done with uh, LiDAR and drones mm-hmm. Well, I've done, I've done a, a few things. One that comes to mind, uh, so I went down to Ecuador and I was in the, uh, the Amazon, like the rainforest, and we had to find some um, buried, I, I don't know if there's too much I can really say about exactly what we were doing. Yep. Uh, there's some stuff still going on, but needless to say, we were in the rainforest and there was some environmental disasters that happened a long time ago and we were trying to you know see, find these on the the floor underneath the in the rainforest and we went out there i remember the first day we, we flew and uh i mean it was thick i mean it was like double canopy like ivy it was like it's like i don't know if this is gonna really work here <laughs> this is we're pushing the, the limits and uh got back and i processed the, the data and uh you know i was just looking at the raw data i was like ah, oh, this is this is not gonna this isn't gonna work too well i was pretty pretty nervous but then we got back the the DEM and the the contours, the surface model, and it was like clear as day. We saw these structures, and there was there was a lot of them, and we were out there flying for like ten days straight every day, and we just found more and more and more. And, and now this is like it's become very impactful for the local uh, economy there. What we're finding, uh, and can't really say too much about the client or, or what it was, but for me to say more about it, uh, you know it was very impactful for me to kind of be down there and see this technology help someone. Yeah. So I think, I think most people's first introduction to LIDAR is watching, you know, the discovery channel. And we found this, this lost civilization. Lion ruins. Essentially you were in the rainforest, flying LIDAR, finding lost civilizations. Yeah. How, did you come up with the concept of Indiana drone? Well, Nick, I think that's, you got, you hit it right there. That's the concept of Indiana drones right there. So I was, yeah, I've been flying. I was doing these jobs all over the world, similar stuff to this. And I was like, I, I'm traveling. I'm, I'm literally going to like these, you know, the rainforest or I was, I was there's one time I was in a uh, Papua New Guinea and we were in this uh, very remote Island off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And we were literally surrounded by people with machetes, like tribesmen. It was like, this is terrifying. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, you know, so Indiana drones is kind of a play on words and we wanted to, to make something fun, but at the same time to deliver good information. You know, that was always my, my background is a, I'm an ex- experimental physicist by training. And I actually taught university physics for a while. And, um, you know, I, I, I hosted a science news radio show for several years and uh, really enjoy this just delivering of information. And to be honest, Indiana Jones is still my favorite part of my work. You know, when I get to make a video and, you know, I see the reaction of people who are watching this and, and learning something new for the first time in such a kind of niche industry, but now it's growing so fast. It's been just awesome. So yeah, Indiana Jones started from, uh, I think one day I was walking, I was going for a run and I just went, Indiana Jones. <laughs> Call up all my friends and I said, "Hey, let's let's. What do you think if I do this?" And they're all like, "Just do it, man. Just do it." Yeah, I mean, I will say, like, you've you've been in this world of lidar of drones longer than I have. Um, 
a lot of a lot of what I have done has been, you know, self-taught, but trying to find stuff online to help with the self-teaching, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot out there. There's a lot out there for drones in general. There's a lot out there for kind of photogrammetry and best practices. Then when you jump into the world of LIDAR, there's still a lot out there, but a lot of it's not information. Mm -hmm. like there's a lot out there about, you know, this is why it's good, or there's plenty of boring, you know, lecture hall kind of science-y, jargony stuff. There's plenty of boring, here's a two-hour video on how to set up a, a flight plan, you know, but there's there's a lot less on the, the foundational, fundamental theory of what LiDAR is, how it works, why it works. And yeah. I stumbled, I stumbled across Indiana drones before you and I had even talked to each other. And they were some of the most concise, but but ultimately informational and interesting videos to watch that are that are out there currently. Awesome, I appreciate you saying that, Nick. It means a lot to me. Yeah, and I I'll jump on the kind of the back of that because you're saying there's all this other content that's uh, you know very th this so this here we are kind of in so let's just talk about the future of the the lidar industry for a second. I think the future of the lighter industry, we're at this this uh, kind of changing point where everything before now, I'll call like LiDAR 1.0, and we're entering this LiDAR 2.0 stage. So kind of defining characteristics of LiDAR 1.0, it was uh, very, very complicated workflows, very difficult hardware, very almost uh, ad hoc. You know, you would see things that were just kind of bolted together. Yep. Um, and this this was a, a very difficult time where the kind of the pe the people that like to tinker in their garage would get into lidar and, and they'd figure it out. Um, now we're in this lidar 2.0, where now it's becoming something that I say this all the time because this this defining characteristic I think crosses into 2.0, and that's before I used to have to plan to do lidar tomorrow. And what I mean by this is like I had to prepare all of my laptops. I had to get all of my extra spare parts, my my car, my truck loaded up. I had like a trailer. You know, I had a lot of stuff and it was a lot of preparing. But now in 2.0 world, we're getting to a point where LiDAR can just be in your back seat. And I think that distinction right there carries a lot with it. So when you do photogrammetry, like the Phantom 4 RTK, you just throw that in the back of the truck. It's just sitting there. And if you need to fly a drone, you fly a drone. Yep. You know, you don't have to, you know, like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to fly the Phantom 4. Let me get everything ready today. Like, you don't do that. So in LiDAR 2.0, LiDAR is also coming to that level where it's just a tool that's there. Yep. It's not this whole complicated thing. And I, I think what we've done at Rock is we've made it that. And also DJI with the L1. I think these are, these are two systems that kind of exist in this 2.0 sp space. But I believe everything's going to be in that space you know, soon and even further. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more. Um, I actually like the way you're referring to it as, you know, LiDAR 1.0 and LiDAR 2.0. Uh, to take that a step further and, and you know, explain the, the drone industry, right? So back mm -hmm. when the drone industry was, was drone 1.0, you were building 15 foot drones to fly with. There was a handful of people doing it. For a while you needed a pilot's license. Drones yeah. were in drone 2.0 stage where it's almost let's pick it up let's learn how to do it let's go fly it obviously there are nuances mm -hmm. but anybody now can can pick up a drone they can download mission management software they can build a flight plan they can do it automatically drone 2.0 mm -hmm. lidar 1.0 was surveyors and engineers you need to know like all these whatever they were, star plot maps and what isthmus you're in. And like, you have to do lever arm measurements and you got to do your foresight calibrations. And, and that's right. to get up and flop, right? To, to make sure you're getting the right information. Right. What you've managed to do is initiate LIDAR 2.0. And mm -hmm. you can read through comments online and stuff about people saying, well, no, you're not doing you know, lever arm measurements. And what about your foresight calibrations? And don't make it look easier than it is. Like, I'm not going to say LIDAR is easy. Mm -hmm. But what you managed to do is initiate LIDAR 2.0, where you've taken a lot of, before I used to have to worry about 
all the nuances of flying the mission. Now I can worry about all the nuances of processing the data. I no longer have to worry about the mission. You've taken the guesswork out of that and said, hey, we can teach anybody how to fly. Well, and then the Rock Cloud makes everything on the processing side just very yeah. easy as well. So now yeah. you can just simply upload your data and then get a deliverable delivered for you. I mean, that's the processing side was a very complicated story for 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 me and LiDAR LiDAR 1.0. It just took me. It was sometimes it would take me days to me how big the site was, you know. So in the Rock Cloud, we made this platform where you can kind of host your data, you can share it. That's that's very new. Like. I, I think people don't understand, like, whenever well, it seemed like sharing deliverables, like, it just, you didn't do it because yeah. you just give them the, like, a DEM or something. They'd never really see the LiDAR data, but just being able to share the data and then order things. Like, I just need planometrics. I need, you know, contours or a accuracy report. And having these things kind of on tap in an easy, accessible place on the Rock Cloud has been, you know, this is really, you know, where our big momentum's at right now. Or, Going to be adding some cool stuff. So we actually just released uh, Ortho Mosaics uh, yesterday. So really? yeah, so now you can actually. So we're not computing the Ortho Mosaic, but we are providing uh, line work. So uh, do, doing planimetrics on Ortho Mosaics as well as doing a lot of processing on them as well. So that's now hosted right there with your lidar data. Let's do a quick a, a quick step back. Um, obviously, we're big fans of the R two A. Um, we've started using them. We're happy with the data sets. We do our accuracy reports. Um, kind of as I mentioned, we still do a lot of our data processing in-house. Um, I'm familiar with the Rock Cloud, mm -hmm. but this is probably a good opportunity to like, I know it's there. I know it exists. I know there's a value. What are all the things the Rock Cloud can give people that don't have experience with processing the data? Yeah, Nick, this is a great question about the, the Rock Cloud. So, and, and you're a perfect person who, because you, you process your own data, right? Like you're pretty good at processing LiDAR data. And, you know, I'd say, honestly, you don't have to do all the QC, QA that you do when you, so, okay, you're on desktop software. The workflow usually looks like this. You, you get your data and then you're going to reproject your data into some coordinate system. And then you're going to start applying a classification schema. So. Maybe you do uh, get rid of some high noise points and some low noise points. Uh, maybe then you do the ground class, and that's like your first iteration of ground class. And then you're going to go and maybe try classifying the buildings because some buildings got in there and you're just too lazy to do it manually. So like do a little pass of that. And then you're going to try you know, cleaning it up a little bit, maybe do some low veg, medium veg, high veg. But then you're going to go into your manual stage where you're just like clicking, you know, and you'll spend quite a while just to clean up this data set. And so, then from that, you just are getting this ground classified data set. And then you're going to use that data set to generate a either like a 10 surface uh, or like a DEM and then contours. But then in this 10 surface stage and the ground class stage, you kind of go back and forth a few times. You know, you're going to look at your 10, you're going to see some misclass stuff, you go back to the clean it up and then reproduce the 10. And this is like the iteration process of uh, cleaning up your data and doing this processing. Now, the Rock Cloud, it just automates all of that. And right. it's very affordable. So it's just $2 an acre. So if you compare the time it takes you, and, and the way we came up with this pricing is like, I process lighter data for so many years. And I said, what is a third of what my time cost whenever I was doing this for a customer? And that was where the price came. And so we just wanted to make it very affordable to also get these deliverables done. But other than that, just being able to get so like contour generation isn't necessarily straightforward. Right. And I, and I would say, I would say every, everything you've described so far, I would consider the basic delivery. The basic, yep. every, like everything you just talked about, that's, that's the basic deliverable. So that's, that's everything that goes into just, you paid for LIDAR. Here's something you can do with it. It's something. Now, yeah. On top of all of that, everything else. Yeah, on top of that, the Rock Cloud just merging data sets. So this is also a pain in the ass, uh, you know, doing on desktop. So say you have like uh, 10 flights or even just two flights, and yeah, you, know, you move the base station around. There could be some vertical adjustments you have to make. So in the Rock Cloud, you can do all that in real time. You just go click, 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 and sync things up, and you click merge. That's huge. Like doing that on desktop software, just usually, I mean, you can do it, and I did it for so many years. 
but you'll you'll move the data set. You click, you know, apply. It actually recomputes the whole LES that's moved, and then you'll start looking at it again. You'll do it again. And so basically, at the end of the day, you'll start out with like maybe like a 10, 20 gig project. And by the time you're done with this processing, you might end up with like a few hundred gigs of just like duplicate data, because every time you apply something, it's always like, yep, it's a whole new a whole new file. Whole new file. So I don't know why it does that. Almost all softwares do this. It's annoying. Our workflow, our workflow for stuff like that is when I have two data sets that overlap, but I need mm -hmm. to come together, right? In the field, we plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. But that means each data set has its own ground control and its own target separate that I QA, QC independently. Then mm -hmm. I can eventually merge them together. Like the raw cloud, you fix all of that. You can totally. Because I watched, I watched, I think you're, um, your corridor alignment with your, your TND lines where you're just making changes on the fly and you just slowly bring it into position and then you're done. Yeah, totally. And pe people, I mean, honestly, I, I got some serious haters in that video too. Like, you can't do that. I was like, what do you think you're doing in photogrammetry whenever you have an aerial target and you click that point and say, that's that point. And then once all of that's done, right. you run your QA, QC, you make sure your control report's tight and then everything's totally. accurate. Totally, totally. Yeah, I'd say, say that and just basic sharing. You know, I think sharing does not get enough credit. And then, you know, just having a, uh, a portal that you can deliver your results to people. Yeah. And these two things are just, they seem like they're very simple things, but there's really not a good way of doing it otherwise. So, you know, we offer this business plan where you can do custom branding. And so when you share it, it actually represents your business. So, yeah. you know, I think... I mean, we're, we're actually going to be going further down that road. You know, we want to really produce an environment that represents you and your business. Um, so that way, whenever you're sharing, it's not just all rock, rock, rock. You know, this is cool. We get it. You know, we understand. I'm not, you know, oblivious to this fact. And I also coming from being a service provider myself, I know how important it is to show my work to people and like be like, this is, this is Fly Guys. You know, this is our deliverable. Yeah, you and essentially, there's... There's a term for that. Um, you're 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 essentially white labeling your software and allowing people to use their own logos as a here. This came from you know, and our, for us obviously it's Fly Guys, but it could be anything you know. Yeah. Louisiana Aerial LLC, like whatever whatever it may be, you're essentially white labeling it and let them put a face on your platform. Oh. Which I think, I mean, just come from a business owner who ran a business doing this stuff. I, that's just really important. It's important to me. Was important to me. Still is important to me. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's so much more, Nick. I think uh, we just talked a ton about the drone industry. We talked a lot about LiDAR. Talked a lot about Fly Guys and this expanding network. I think, uh, honestly, so you guys just raised uh, $4 million to go after this. Yeah. And yeah, this is our Series A, which is super exciting. That's super exciting, man. Are you, uh, what's... What's kind of the big uh, goal with the Series A? I know usually you have to have a use of funds. Like, where? What's the yeah, big you know, with all your run rates and schedules, and it comes with you know board approval, and you got all these T's to cross and I's to dot. Um, honestly, I try to I try to lower my head and just stay in operations and work on workflows. I know, oh, I know sure. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it, but. Obviously, our marketing is is up and running. We're trying to reach more people. We're trying to educate. We're hopefully coming up with that whole pilot outfit where we can begin, you know, pilot outreach and training and all of that. So I know there's a few initiatives um, on the docket. I don't know what I'm supposed to talk about yet, but <laughs> for me, I'm trying to stay in operations with my head down to keep, you know, building better processes and generating tighter data. Absolutely. Do you want to talk about exciting stuff that's happening with Rock? Because a little birdie told me that y'all might be going global soon. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this this is it. Rock is trying to expand very aggressively. You know, we uh, we have product market fit. So, okay, everyone watching, I think I feel pretty comfortable talking about this stuff because. Uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I love startup culture. I love drones and all, all the technology that we produce, but also just uh, creating something in a marketplace is a very exciting thing for me. I just really enjoy it. Um, and so Rock right now is uh, pretty much, we're very motivatedly expanding the Rock world into other countries uh, through distributors, partners in other countries. So 
if anyone is trying to become a distributor, you always hit us up. Uh, you can always buy a LiDAR system from Fly Guys. They uh, also are providing this equipment. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think, I think the ag aggressive expansion of what we have. So in, in the nomenclature of, you know, a startup's journey, right? So we, we have this uh, product market fit. So right now the, the market has responded to us very positively. They love our hardware, love our software. And we're, we've been iterating on this. And this, the company is actually started by me and my brother, Alex. And so Alex and I, uh, you know, we talk about this all the time. And so now we're like, we feel really good about this. And we want to take this technology and move it to the rest of the world. And kind of the reason that we are doing it now and not before is that, um, you know, we really wanted to get this workflow down of, you know, someone brand new to LiDAR coming in, getting a system from us, getting onboarded and trained, and then getting them flying and capturing good data. But then on the back end, having support and being able to maintain this whole pipeline from I've never done this to now I'm making money and I'm successful. And so we've iterated that hundreds of times now. And we feel really good about this business model and the product and the product market fit. So now we want to take this business model and product market fit and just duplicate it into another country, duplicate it into another country and kind of just expand. And I think uh, as we're doing this, I know Fly Guys is also going to be doing an expansion. And I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity, the yeah. synergies together. Yeah, let me let me just take a moment to shout out your support team. Uh, I've worked with a few companies now in LiDAR realm specifically. I've worked with more than that in a photogrammetry realm. Um, there are a few companies that come to mind when I think of quality support. And that would be Drone Deploy actually does a pretty good job of getting back to you in a timely fashion. They have the live support ticket. Um, I've been doing LiDAR for a while. Y'all have the best support staff I've ever seen. Um, yes. like I, don't, I don't think I've waited longer than five minutes to get at least a response from somebody saying, hey, we're actively looking at this. We're going to figure it out. We'll have an answer for you as soon as possible. And then, I mean, I don't think I've waited longer than 20 minutes to have an answer. Honestly, Nick, uh, everyone told me we can't do it. So when I talked to all my other friends in the drone industry, business owners, like, oh, you can't do that. You'll go, you know, you'll lose business. You'll go under all this stuff. I fundamentally don't believe it. I, I, I thank you for saying that because we, we talk about support endlessly inside the company. It's, it's always something that every day we're all, everyone in the company talks about it. Even our developers are talking about support. You know, it's glad to hear you say that. <laughs> All right. Well, appreciate it. Well, I think uh, I think we covered most of the questions here on this talk. Uh, this has been uh, Fly Guys and Rock Robotic talking about the drone industry and LiDAR. And I uh, hope you guys stay tuned for the next uh, next session. Yeah, perfect.